Why, hello there. It's me, Jeremy, your favorite bald dude telling you about Standard and Strange, a store and a brand with simple rules. Sell clothes they themselves would wear, manufacture it ethically, and build it to last. From boots made in Oregon to loop wheel garments made in Japan, find all the best clothes for your wardrobe at Standard and Strange. Standardandstrange.com. Hey folks, my name is Jeremy Kirkland and this is Blamo, a podcast about people and clothes. Yep, all that good stuff. How are we doing? Life is uh life's going steady over here, you know, lots of ups and downs. We got that fall and summer smashing together at the moment. I've been throwing myself into some new books. You know, spooky season is upon us. I'm about to crack open Dracula Daily, which is uh I got I got to plug this. I will definitely do this cuz I'm a fan. But it's uh, Bram Stoker's original novel in real time. So it's not Dracula. This is Dracula Daily. And I got to plug it because my cousin put it together. My cousin, Matt Kirkland. Way to go, buddy. Really, really proud of him. No, he didn't write Dracula. He just turned the classic book into a real time newsletter and then turned it into a book again with everyone's commentary. Smart move. Anyway, I'm excited to read it. I don't usually do plugs, but, like, you know, I'm proud. So uh, I've also been watching nature documentaries about bugs and spiders and all sorts of creepy stuff. Um, not because I want to get scared. I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm on the learning binge, but I'm getting into it. By the way, side note, is anyone a don't kill spiders household? This is an honest question because uh, I know a few folks that if they see the spider, they're just like, you know, go off, do your thing. I don't know. I'm debating. I've also been binging the epic podcast, Periodic Talks, hosted by Gillian Jacobs who's actually our guest this week. What do you know? And geez, she was incredible, and we went just all over the map. First off, Gillian is an incredibly talented actor. She has amazing style, and is also, she's a bit of a curious scientist. Gillian and I discuss how science and her love of nature has been a part of her life since the beginning, from dinosaur birthday parties to roaming museums. We chat about living in New York in the early aughts, her massive vintage collection, the clothes her grandma made for her, how her style has evolved, Tom Brown and her favorite designers. It's Gillian Jacobs on Blamo. Dig in. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Good. <laughs> I yeah, I will I'll say this at the beginning before we were recording. You're you know, you and I chatted a bit on social beforehand, and I have been binging periodic talks. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it's it's really, really good. And I think for me, I had no idea that your love of like bugs and animals <laughs> and science and all this stuff. And especially as, as you know, I have a five-year-old who just started kindergarten. So I've been in moments of grief as I drop her off oh. every day. But like wanting her to care about, you know, life and science and things like that. And so it's been really, really cool listening to your show. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know that like the show is kind of uh, dark at the moment, but like what's where did some of this stuff come from? Because yeah. I think, you know, many people know you for your, you know, your work as an actor, but like the science stuff is very much, you know, a thread throughout your life. Yeah. So I think it all probably started with the fact that my mom worked at um, a natural history museum when I was really little. Um, and so I have very early memories of going there. Um, and the natural history museum in Pittsburgh has an enormous dinosaur collection. Um, wow. So Andrew Carnegie uh, was one of the first people to fund uh, dinosaur digs in the U.S., and uh, so it's the Carnegie Museum of Natural History. And so because of mm -hmm. that, they have an enormous collection. And so I was totally dinosaur obsessed as a kid. I had a dinosaur themed birthday party. I dressed as T-Rex for Halloween one year. Um, so probably it goes <laughs> all the way back. Wait, how, how old are you with the T-Rex? How old are you in the T-Rex? I'm like kindergarten or preschool. I have it. Um, Wait, you have it? Yeah. My mom sent me all of my... She's looking around. I'm looking closet, around. I'm in a speak. closet, dear listener. Um, <laughs> but my grandmother made me a green velvet T-Rex uh, costume when I was a child with a tail. And, you know, so I think it probably goes back to that. And then I was um, I was telling... I think I, I talked about it on Periodic Talks where I was 
a teen docent then at that same natural history museum um, when I was older. And so I, I think it, it goes back and my mom has always loved birds. And when I was a kid, I wasn't really interested in that, you know, but she would always be pointing out birds to me. And so I, I'm sometimes surprised that the number of bird names I know, and then I guess it just must be by osmosis, you know, from my mom. <laughs> and it's just one of those things in life where like, I totally rejected it as a kid, but now as an adult, I'm like, could stare at a bird for quite some time, you know, that I think a lot of people experience that, you know, with things they never thought they would be interested in when they were kids or teenagers. And, and then another big key one was discovering this caterpillar. <laughs> I Go discovered on. this caterpillar in my backyard that uh, is the giant swallowtail butterfly caterpillar. And it goes through all of these kind of amazing stages as a caterpillar where I walked by this tree um, and I thought it was covered in bird poop. And then I realized it was all of these caterpillars. And so at one stage Whoa. of its development, it mimics bird poop as a form of protection and I was just astounded when the bird poop started moving. And then <laughs> and then I saw that it also, the front of the caterpillar, its markings also, and the, and the shape of it are to imitate a snake. So it looks like snake eyes and a snake head. And then it Whoa. also, when it feels threatened, can shoot out this uh, forked uh, orange. It looks like a snake's tongue that shoots out of its head as another protection um, method. And it like emits a bad smell, too. So I just became completely fascinated by this caterpillar and like how had it evolved <laughs> to have all these defense mechanisms and how can it look like poop and a snake at the same time? <laughs> <laughs> And so then I was just tracking this caterpillar and watching it then form into a chrysalis. And then I was looking at the chrysalis all the time. And the chrysalis, when it forms a chrysalis, it looks like wood bark almost exactly. Well, this is a marathon yeah, of and, nature here. And then I happened to just walk by at the perfect moment when the butterfly emerged from that chrysalis. And so I got to see the butterfly emerge and watch it fly around for the first time. And so I think that also set me on a whole other path. And so, yeah, birds and caterpillars, butterflies, uh, all, all of those things I'm really fascinated by these days. I feel like there's this renaissance or like resurgence of people that are really into birds right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Like, do you have the Merlin app? I don't. Okay. Do I need I'll to get plug it? this? <laughs> you, you definitely do. Okay. So it's, it's, um, it's this iOS app that's done, um, in, collaboration or uh, from Cornell University. And what it is, is it's basically like a birding, like bird watching and listening app. Ooh. And it records. So, you know, my wife does this where she'll go out on the deck at night in our house and she'll turn the app on and it'll, you know, record the bird noises and stuff. And then it'll tell you what the birds are. Wow. And then you, yeah, it, it uses your location. I, I swear to God, this is not an ad. It uses your location and uh, we'll be like, hey, here are the birds that are going to be relatively common around you around this time of year. Here are the ones that are uncommon uh -huh. that you may see. Like there are like giant blue uh, herons, yes. I think, near us right now. Yes. Like I'm like, I don't know why they're there. And there was a there was like a barred owl in our backyard. Wow. I live like in the suburbs, but basically suburbs that never should have been anyway. So there's a lot of like nature that it backs into. <laughs> wow. Yes. I'm yeah. so into. Okay. And then the thing that really like kicked it up another level with me was when we interviewed this avian paleontologist for periodic talks. Yeah. And I had never really thought about it before, but yeah, birds are dinosaurs. So they're, oh, yeah. they're the, you know, the creatures that survived the mass extinction event. And um, so if you're if you were ha fascinated by dinosaurs as a child and you suddenly realize that you're surrounded by them all the time, every day, you're I mean, I'm obsessed with the great blue herons as well. And I mean, that looks like a dinosaur. Come on. I mean, like, yeah, it does. You know, it does. They're very foreign. <laughs> uh. um, and so that I think has added a whole other element of fascination with for me and thinking about why did these different birds evolve to have these different features or functions or size or coloring or all these things given the environment where they lived. And so I, yeah, I, I feel like it's added a little bit of wonder and excitement into my day. And maybe that's what you're trying to instill in your child too. It's like an excitement about the world around us 
um, and the physical world, yeah. m- most importantly for me, because I think, yeah, m- most people, you know, they're which I, I get. And sometimes like parents have it where they're the babysitter is a screen, you know, uh, and there's good programming out there. Like Daniel Tiger is legit uh, for all the parents out there. But like, yeah, I mean, just showing her nature and the unpredictability of it and the beauty of it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's the pod is really, really good. Oh, thank um, you so much. Yeah. Are you, do you ever see yourself maybe venturing into things more on the nature sort of side, like outside of what you currently do? Oh, that would be great. I would love that. I mean, I I would love, you know, I've made a few documentaries. I've never done any that were nature um, oriented, Mm -hmm. but I I think that could be really fun. I I would love to, because I I mean, it. you know, yes, I haven't been working on that podcast in a while, but the interest has not abated for me. And I will read articles about various things and I'll be like, oh, I wish I could make a podcast. And like, I got really into um, arborists recently. And oh, yeah. And so I really those are like tree doctors for folks. Um. (laughs) And so I was introduced to this woman who's like a very renowned arborist in California. And I thought she was amazing. And I really wanted, and I was a moment where I was like, oh, I wish we were still doing the podcast because I would love to interview her. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I still have that itch. Yeah. Yeah. Do you, um, do you like go on regular nature walks and stuff around LA now? I mean, cause there's tons of wildlife there. Yeah. So I, I, haven't really, but I just got a book put out by the um, Natural History Museum here in Los Angeles, and they actually have really great um, maps of various like differing degrees of difficulty hikes or excursions you can go on and give you a sense oh. of like what plants or birds you could see there. So that's inspiring me to want to do it more. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I would like to. To like connect this back to when you were a kid, like, did you grow up with pets or did you have any pets? We had cats when I was growing up. Um, oh, I always wanted a dog. I was not allowed to have a dog. Uh, so yeah, we had. Wait, why cats over a dog? I think because my mom was a single working mom, and like the re- the schedule of having to walk the dog and you know all oh. of that. Because she would, you know, she would work until like sometimes like nine or 10, 11 at night. So, you know, it was, I spent a lot of time with the babysitter. Uh, and, and I think like, yeah, it would have been overwhelming. Um, I think she was correct in assuming that I would not be like super diligent about you taking the dog on walks and ever, you know, all the things you need to do for a dog. So a cat, I think was easier to handle. Yeah. Yeah. Cats are, yeah, I guess they're definitely much more uh, <laughs> docile. And the fact that you're not having to like take them out. Yeah. We had a dog. My wife and I had a dog for like the first part of our marriage before, mostly before we had kids. And it was like the best and hardest thing <laughs> ever. And it was in a weird way, it was like step one of kids yeah. because you're just like having to take care of something that does somewhat, you know, respond and love back to you. But it's, you know, it, it's it's progressively getting worse. And, you know, we, we were paying for, we used to pay for, what's it, um, like behavior lessons uh-huh. and, and dog training and it was a total shit show. And then the dog, and then like during the pandemic, the dog had cancer because we oh. adopted her and she was like 17. We had to put her down. Oh, I'm sorry. And it was just like, no, it, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's life, but um, I get it. Like I, we would probably get cats if I wasn't so deathly allergic. Oh, but, you are? You know? Yeah. I mean, it's, I kind of like making fun of cats in general because they're just <laughs> harder to deal with and have attitudes and stuff. <laughs> but um, so in Pittsburgh, you also were telling me that you were, you know, on one hand, you have the nature side, but then the other hand, you're talking about you were obsessed with this book, oh, this yes. Hollywood glamour book. I also want to note that, like, as a child, I did not want to be in nature. I liked dinosaurs. Like, my mom could barely convince <laughs> me to go out. strong correction. There. Yes, because I don't want to give the false impression that I was, like, exploring in the woods as a child. No. My mom always talks about, like, in the dead of summer, I would be sitting inside with all the blinds drawn. So I, I was... This is like truly coming full circle where, you know, I, this is very much later in life <laughs> wanting to be outside. <laughs> so I'll say I was really into dinosaurs as a child, um, reading about them, looking at them within mm-hmm. the confines of a museum. But yes, yeah, so I was also <laughs> really into um, movies from the golden age of Hollywood. So I was obsessed with Katherine Hepburn as a child. I owned yeah. several biographies of her. her autobiography. And I was also given at some point a book 
which was about the style of all of these famous movie stars from like the very early days of the silent era, maybe through like the 50s or 60s. And so I just remember obsessively studying that and would be talking about, you know, the um, fashion designers they worked with or the costume designers. So I was probably a rare child who knew who Edith Head was, you know, I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was really into that. Um, so yeah, I was very into Katherine Hepburn. Um, but a lot of, you know, um, time spent looking at photos. I, I used to go home and listen to Cole Porter songs. Um, that would be Whoa, like, <laughs> that's heavy. Yeah. Like I'd go home from school and listen to like Cole Porter. So I, I don't know. I, I was like not really connecting with kids my own age uh, in terms of the interest. <laughs> yeah. Like, did you did you get any sort of period dresses or anything at that time? Or? So I think another factor about uh, why I was probably really into that was that my grandmother was a dressmaker. Um, she sewed a lot. She made a lot of you know, um, in the like 30s, 40s, 50s was making a lot of her own clothes. And when my mom and her siblings were little, she would like make make matching mother and child outfits uh, for them. I actually have some of those. Once again, this is I didn't know we were doing this in in the archive, the Jacobs archive. (laughs) I know I have I have a lot of things that my grandmother made. like oh my god this is like a she's actually holding up yeah, the dress it's a holy shit it's a skirt that has like a little matching vest that she made that looks like Bodhi. yeah i know my and people <laughs> i mean i i should like post pictures of this stuff my grandmother had great style and um so she i think probably inspired me as well and um oh there's a little matching kerchief as well that just dropped so yeah i have become um, in my family, the person who who has all the things, which is why this closet is so packed. Uh, I have my mom's wedding suit right over there that my grandmother made for her. My grandmother, when I was little, made me um, a robe and a matching one for my Barbie. She, As I said, she made my T-Rex costume. She made a lot of my early Halloween costumes by hand. And there were pictures of my grandmother. You know, by the time she was my grandmother, she was actually wearing a lot of like um she was like right on trend for grunge like a lot of of flannel and like men's jeans so yeah. and clogs which i i wear we clogs. find out your grandmother is vivian westwood you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh yeah so i think that that was probably a big inspiration uh for me too but i i don't know they put it together at the time yeah i was gonna say i think the bigger thing that is the most surprising behind all this is the fact that you have this yeah like you physically own this. Like I don't know many people. Oh my gosh! Whatever their life or career is, that have yeah okay. the clothes that they wore as a kid. Okay, and here's another one that I have right here. Was that like I I I wanted to be different. Um, and okay. so I only went to a few school dances, but one of the ones I went to, I always bought vintage. So this was like my homecoming dress, which is like oh a 1950s God. party dress that I got at this vintage store in Pittsburgh. And so, yeah, I was I was really into like wearing vintage uh, for school <laughs> dances. Wait, wh- I, why did you want to be different? That's a bigger thing. I think that I well, a I like I think I already liked it because I was watching these movies and studying mm-hmm. these you know costume designers and these fashion designers, and I, I think I also, to be totally honest, like realized that adults really liked my precociousness around these things, <laughs> and I did. I was very awkward around kids my own age, um, but okay. I always got along really well with adults, and I think they all found it kind of like funny and cute that I was into these things. So I think that encouraged me as well to be totally candid. (laughs) Yeah, no, no, it's fine. I mean, I, we, um, we didn't have cable or like real TV. I'm kind of air quoting that when I was little. And so a lot of the stuff that I would watch when I was younger was tapes from the library. Uh Oh yeah. So Mm -hmm. yeah. So we would go to our local library and it's funny because there was actually, you know, for some folks, they'd be like, oh, I could only watch stuff from the library because I grew up in some religious household or et cetera. And it's like, dude, the library had oh, like, yeah. that was where I first discovered um, Faulty Towers yes. and Monty Python yeah. and, and and obviously one of the greatest shows of all time. Uh, please don't get pissed at me. Uh Agatha Christie's Poirot. Are you kidding me? That Suchet. was like Friday nights with my mom was watching David Suchet 
Agatha Christie. Hell yes. I was, Let's go. I was obsessed. <laughs> obsessed. I think I've read almost every Poirot mystery. Uh, before that, oh, so I was good. like a Sherlock Holmes completist. I had a two volume of like all the Sherlock <laughs> Holmes. I was a total mystery obsessed kid. Yeah, it's they're they're good, especially for the fashion yes, too, because 30, I think like there's between the wars, like bingo. Yes. Yeah, there there was like this era of accessibility from the Industrial Revolution, but there was still things that were not as mass produced, you know, so you kind of had the sweet spot for clothes. And, and I'm aware this was a television show on the BBC, but like, I mean, obviously the BBC just nails all of the production stuff, but the David Suchet, for folks who don't know, he, you know, I don't, I don't know how many Agatha Christie Poirots there are, but he basically did every single one yeah. as a TV show. And this, they were like 90 minute episodes. I think you can watch them on other networks or stuff, but you know, I'm not going to plug anything, but like the, it's, it's so it's such a crazy experience because it's also this like slice of like life and innocence into where there's not really like Agatha Christie's books. Yes, there's always a murder, but like it's not this like, I don't know, I'm not glorifying murder in any way, but it's like this. It's just this mystery, yeah. right? It's not some sort of craziness to it. And it, you know, I always wanted to escape into Poirot's world because of his little suits and things like that. And Hastings is always an idiot, yep. but he's somehow, you know. God, it's so good. Oh, yeah. That was like a big Friday night for us. It was like I was allowed but, to eat on a tray in the living room while watching that. <laughs> what were you eating? <laughs> well, unfortunately, my, my, I've told her this. My mom was not a great cook. but I, <laughs> <laughs> And I'm a terrible cook. So I, I'm not saying this from a place of like, you know, I, I'm no better. Um, but I... <laughs> I I can't I I've I'm trying I'm struggling to I I just remember she was always making me eat lima beans which I have to get oh. I have to get over cuz I still have that like childhood aversion to lima beans. Um Well the also lima beans at that time were like really shitty. Yeah. Like I remember eating green beans and most of that stuff it was out of a can. I think we're close to the same age. I don't know. But like we're um you know my daughter like we'll give her green beans and stuff and I'm like these are great. Yeah. Like you don't know what I had to eat, dude. Like these these were just all out of a can and gross and Oh, there were so many know. vegetables I discovered as an adult and especially moving to California. <laughs> you know, things I just never encountered. So Yeah. So you have so to go back, you have all these dresses yes. that you got. <laughs> sure. You wanted to be weird. Yeah. So what what are the folks Check. at your school I was wearing? Weird. <laughs> <laughs> what were the folks at your school wearing I mean, when you're showing up in some sort of vintage well, dress yeah, or something? I, that your I, I wasn't always wearing vintage, but my mother was in total control of my wardrobe until I went to college. Like she would not <gasps> let me buy anything that she didn't like. And so Whoa. she did dress me in also a lot of like I was dressed like a um a businesswoman, maybe going to like the junior league meeting. So it was a lot of twin sets. I had so many twin sets in high school, um, okay. matching shell and cardigan, you know, in various colors. These are all incredible. Yeah. Though you sound a little bit uh, remorseful, perhaps, well, about I, it know, or something. I just remember <laughs> going to a store and like wanting to dress a more like people my own age. And like, sure. and her just shutting me down. Um, my, I, I think the only like rebellion I was allowed to have was like, I was allowed to wear various like styles of Doc Martens. Um, but like a lot of oh, bingo. khaki chinos, twin sets. Um, and then, the, you know, I grew up in suburban Pittsburgh. So it was like Abercrombie and Fitch, I thought was the most expensive, fanciest store in the world. Yeah. Um, Put a moose on it. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> Gap and, you know, um, Express Limited, like that, those, I'm trying to remember, Benetton, those were all the stores. Um, what was your mall? It was called the Galleria, and I could walk to it from my house, and they had a great movie wow. theater. Uh, it was like a very fancy mall. Um, and yeah, but I, I think I probably just almost exclusively was shopping at the Gap. Um, okay. And so then I go from that to moving to New York City for college at 17. You know, yeah. Oh, wait, you were at college at 17? Yeah, I, w I was young for my class. So I turned 18 okay. the fall of my freshman year. So yeah, I started college at 17. And um, so that was huge for me because I was, I loved looking at magazines and looking at like fashion shows. And I was sort of aware of 
designers and all those things. I remember um, I had like a Vanity Fair subscription and, you know, I was like, (laughs) (laughs) um, but I had never seen anyone in real life just walking down a street wearing anything that would have been in like Vogue or Elle or, you know, so moving to New York and going to the Upper East Side, going to Soho, going around the city, I was seeing people wear this clothing daily and then discovering stores like Barney's and Bergdorf Goodman. And I would go there and um, and I would try on dresses that I could never, ever afford. And I remember it's so like pathetic looking back, but I thought I was putting together like my fanciest outfit so that the people working there would let me try on the clothes. Like I thought I had to like <laughs> be dressed, but my clothes weren't fancy, but it was like the nicest stuff I owned that I would put on to go to Barney's to try on like an Alexander McQueen dress, you know, that I was like obsessed with. And I remember one time I got one stuck halfway over my head and I was just pouring <laughs> sweat because it was many thousands of dollars. And uh, they're, you know, banging on the dressing room door being like, are you okay? Can we get you anything? And I'm like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I somehow thankfully managed to get out of it without ripping it. But I was truly terrified. Oh, my God. <laughs> I think we had very, very similar stories in that sense. Like, I moved to New York when I was 18. Mm-hmm. And I I didn't have, you know, maybe the uh, the wardrobe sort of prescription with, with the paternal situation <laughs> that you had. but Or maternal situation you had. But, like... The, um, when I moved out there, it was, it's very weird. I don't know if it's the city or the age, I think that, or maybe a combination of the both of the both that gives you this sort of like freedom and inspiration Mm -hmm. to reinvent yourself. Totally. Yeah. And so I remember I went to Dior and this is like Hedy Slimane Dior. And I, I was living in the Lower East Side. I think my rent at the time was 450 or, or, you know, on 106 Norfolk street. And I went up there and it was Hedy Slimane jeans and my the jeans were 600 bucks yeah. or something like that. And I bought them. <gasps> and I you did? Was a, it, was, it was so stupid. Look, I admit, I, you know, I got into a lot of debt early <laughs> on because I was just a buffoon. And yeah, I bought these jeans and I felt so fucking cool. And I was walking around and then I had, I went to um, Century 21. Oh, yeah. And I found old Marc Jacobs rat t-shirts with the little rat logo. And that was like my outfit. And I would go to Miss Shapes or whatever. (laughs) And I was like, check me out in my Dior jeans. But it was like this level of, you know, I I too dressed up to try to make people think that I was like, take me serious. Yeah. And it was weird that I needed the clothes to get someone to think of that way because I just couldn't think of that way myself. Well, it's it's just like a, it's, it was so shocking to me, you know, because everyone I grew up with, we all were basically wearing variations of the same thing, too. It was a very limited wardrobe. Um, And so then also just to see true personal style of people on the subway or walking around on the streets, it was inspiring, too, to like, what do I actually want to wear? What do I actually like? And then within like the confines of what I could afford, you know, um, and and like you said, that reinvention and also going from you know, a suburban high school where, yeah, I was already kind of weird for wearing like a a skirt that my grandma had made to like, no one would even look twice at that in New York and kind of like pushing myself, I think back at some of the outfits that I wore, you know, (laughs) where I was just like, I think just trying to push myself way outside of my comfort zone. Uh, I don't know the thing they were good looks, uh, but you know, it was like that freedom, like of feeling like you could walk out the door and nobody would think twice about it in new york yeah hello is this thing on all right whatever we got to get new gear we got to get some new threads whatever you want to call it check out the folks at standard and strange not only do they sponsor this podcast hello but they're one of my favorite stores on earth with locations in new york oakland and santa fe with incredible brands like real mccoy's orslo freno and more look they even got brands i don't even know how to pronounce but they're cool and so are you you going to get some quality gear from a quality crew? Does that sound cheesy? I don't even care because their clothes and team are so good. So visit standardandstrange.com or check them out in person at one of their amazing stores. That's standardandstrange.com. And now, back to the show. When how old were you when you realized that the stuff you had was actually cool? I don't, I don't think I had anything. I I mean you mean like wearing like vintage or my grandma's stuff or like when I realized that was cool or? Yeah, I think because the thing that's interesting about all this is 
you know, you you developed your own taste. Yeah. Right. And so like when when was it that you're like, oh, my God, like, you know, you look, you know, a lot of us will look back at uh, parts of our childhood or adolescence and we're like, oh, I was so, you know, I didn't know what I had. Yeah. Like, I didn't know what to be grateful for. Like, what? how old were you when you realized that you're like, oh, my God. I mean, because obviously you've held on to these things as they're yeah. sentimental. Um, I think I always thought they were cool. Like, you know, my grandmother had really small feet. She wore a size five. So in in Whoa. like seventh grade, I could wear all of her shoes and then I grew out of them. And I was like proudly, excitedly wearing them. Um, I think, I don't know, maybe I just knew it was a lost cause that I was never going to be popular. So I was just going to wear what I wanted to wear. But then I was also like incredibly insecure and wanted deeply to be popular. But I, I whatever weird, you know, I think you succeeded. I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, it, I, I don't know. I, I think I think my mom always also encouraged me to be like as much as she was controlling my clothing. <laughs> sure. She also did like encourage me in a lot of other ways to be myself and to n- not feel like I had to fit in. So probably that I think, you know, I don't know without my mom's encouragement um, if it would have been exactly the same. Um well, here's the other thing I have to say is that like I was in I got I was lucky that as a kid I was in a lot of um plays with adult professional actors. Like I got the experience of being like the kid in the in the professional theater production with, you know, adult actors and so I also think that I had a kind of like unique exposure, you know, of from like age 12 through 17 of like meeting and getting to like be colleagues with fully formed adults who were artistic, interesting people. And so I think that was like a really distinct experience for me where I was spending a lot of my time. Like I said, I was not as socially adept with people my own age, but I was getting to spend a lot of time with these directors and the other actors and, you know, costume designers and being in plays. And so I think that that was also probably really big. Um, I was getting lots of outside input from other than just like my immediate circle of kids I was going to school with. Do you remember like the first bit of advice or input you got that really resonated with you? I mean, the thing that I think really stayed with me was like, if you're on time, you're late, Uh, you know, especially (laughs) doing... I did notice you were yes. early to our to our recording because I logged in. And I was like, "Shit, it, she's already yeah, there!" Yeah, so like doing theater, it's is so essential that you be punctual and you better preferably be early. So, um, yeah, that that I think was formative for me as a kid. Um, you know, you have to sign in when you get to the theater, or sign in to rehearsal, yeah. um, all these things. And so I was, I I feel really lucky that I was given that lesson i think i did the first like god i did the my first play performance when i was like eight or nine so from a very early age yeah what was it it was primarily a dance piece it was like a ballet of the story the steadfast toy soldier but it had one acting part and the rest of it was dance and so they used to list um, auditions in the local paper on fridays in the pittsburgh post gazette And so I'd been taking acting classes for a bit. And then my mom and I started looking at the paper and seeing if there was anything that needed kids in it. And so Mm -hmm. this was the first audition I went on. And I didn't realize that it was primarily a ballet or a dance piece. And so when I showed Mm -hmm. up, they assumed that I was there for the dance audition. And I am a (gasps) terrible dancer. And so I was thrown into this room with all these other kids who were trained, amazing dancers. And um, given like, you know, a 12 count to learn. And I was so God awful that the director pulled me aside at the end and was like, you're not here for the dance audition, are you? And I was like, no. Oh, no. <laughs> but then they got me in the right room and I actually got that job, which I think was like a very bad precedent to set for a career as an actor, <laughs> of, like, booking your first part. So that was a really fun, amazing experience for me. And I, so yeah, I was the only, I was at the beginning and the end of the piece and the rest of the show I was, asleep on the side of the stage on this like hard styrofoam quote unquote mattress on this bed and so okay. it was like my dream you know like the the dance was like my dream yeah. um and so yeah. I, uh, I i yeah i vividly remember doing that show um and getting to meet all the dancers and be in rehearsal and do the performances seeing live plays to me is still really weird and i, I say this <laughs> like hear me out in the sense because you know 
I never realized it until someone was like, oh, like live theater is so good because you're breathing the same air as them. Oh. And I never thought of that. And I was like, wow, like what an intimate, you know, experience that you have yeah. with these other actors into which, you know, and when I started realizing that, I was like, oh my gosh, like, you know, somebody's coughing affects their performance. Totally. Like, you know, not that like they're not good enough to handle that, but just like we're all in this together yes. in a way. And it, it's, it was, it totally changed my perspective because- when I was younger, my older brother was trying to be an actor or something, and my mom would take him. There's this place in St. Louis called the Muni, which still exists, and they would do, you know, outdoor uh, plays. And so he was, I think he was in um, Oliver oh, with yes. like Davy Jones from the Monkees. Oh my God. And he, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, he wasn't with Davy, but he was, uh, yeah, he was one of the the orphans in Oliver and... Um, and then he was in like Peter Pan and he would do all these things. And I remember just seeing the the rigorous, you know, training that like these young kids did and, you know, the singing and the dancing and then seeing everyone do it and knowing that each night could be slightly different. Yeah. You know, even as a younger kid, it, it gave me this sort of level of appreciation that, you know, like, I don't think I understood Shakespeare until maybe two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> so like I faked it like, like someone who knew all the Smashing Pumpkins lyrics when they were younger, <laughs> like just like <laughs> pretending that, but like seeing that stuff, it, it really changed my perspective of, of all that. And I just have this level of appreciation where now I'm like, I want to see live theater yeah. like more than ever, you know, I mean, it's, it's so um that's so that's crazy so you got to do that and so you're you're kind of navigating your way and then then you hit school in new york and you know the school you were at um if can i plug your school like i can obviously sure, edit yeah it. i mean you you go to juilliard yeah. which is a, a pretty incredible school to learn how to um you know hone your art um and i think you know, that's, that's where, you know, it sounded like you also at the same time were like discovering more about yourself from your fashion to where like, you know, I think we were talking earlier and you talked about calling the Prada boutique. Oh my God. Like, yes. <laughs> talk to me about this. <laughs> Okay, so I, you know, was discovering fashion. I was looking up all the fashion shows online. I was getting really into this. I was okay. getting to see the clothes in these fancy department stores. I was seeing people walking around in the streets. And the pro and how old are you at this time? I'm like, you know, 17, 18, 19, you know, that, those ages. Okay. And, um, and so I discovered the Prada store in Soho and it has, you know, those, uh, I haven't been to it in years. So tell me if it's changed, but like it almost had like stadium seating where it was going, like going down. Like it was. Yeah. I think this was the REM. This is the REM yes. Coolhouse Prada. Yes. I think. Yeah. And so I was like, oh, that could be like seating and you could do a performance. And I think I knew yeah. that Mrs. Prada was very into art. Um, <laughs> and so I had some convoluted idea that they would want Juilliard theater students to do a performance there. And I remember. I, I mean, it sounds amazing. I, well, we didn't even have anything to do. And I didn't even ask my classmates. <laughs> I just like I think I wanted in at the, you know, at Prada. So, I yeah, yeah. I, I like just cold called or emailed the Prada store in Soho and never heard anything back, unsurprisingly. <laughs> oh my God. I feel like they probably would regret that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know that. what we would have done. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so I think I was also seeing like the intersection of like art and fashion. And, you know, I was really yeah. into Alexander McQueen runway shows at that time. And um, so I think I, I just thought it was really cool. And I'd had like a little bit of a taste of some kind of like performance art in high school. I went to this summer arts program that I'm forever plugging because the state of Pennsylvania defunded it years ago. And I would love to bring it back because it was truly one of the most incredible experiences of my life um, with no hyperbole. It was called the Governor's School for the Arts. And so, it, oh, this is also, this was hugely formative to me as a person too. So it was like, Five weeks over the summer. Um, it was completely free. It was paid for by the state. Uh, it was 200 kids wow. from around the state. And it was all these different art areas. So there were dancers, visual artists, writers, actors, musicians, basically, you name it, they had it. We were all living in the dorms at this college, taking classes. And every night there was a performance. And so oh, wow. we would all get to see each other do our various art areas all the time. You'd go to like a poetry reading, you'd go to an art gallery, you'd see a modern dance performance. And the guy who ran the theater program there um, had a kind of like performance art 
a site-specific theater company in Philadelphia. And so the pieces he was having us do was not like we were doing like Bye Bye Birdie. Like we were creating, I remember we created a piece based on the paintings of Edvard Munch in the like grotto lawn area. You know, Whoa. so it was to me, it was completely mind blowing because although I'd been doing a lot of theater before then, it was much more I was doing Shakespeare. I was doing, my, you know, musicals. It was much more traditional. I had never been part of something like that. And so I was just obsessed with it. And that, I think, probably inspired me to email the Prada store. <laughs> Because I was like, I could make That's, a site specific piece here. I think, but there, there's a, um, I don't know. There, there's like a an innocence in that, oh, yeah. that I think is is great, right? Yeah. Like, I mean, why not? And like, why shouldn't you do? It? Do you remember what was it called? I don't even know if it still exists. It was like improv everywhere. Oh yeah. And they would just do like random, you know, I don't, I don't even know what they called it. It was like swarms or whatever yes. of like live stuff at Union Square and things like that. Yeah. No, I, yes. And I, I, and I'd had another, uh, teacher back in, um, Pittsburgh in high school who was also telling us about that sort of, uh, the history of that as well. And we were like concocting pieces there. And I don't know if we ever did it, but I think we were supposed to like go out on the streets and do performances, but I, I was maybe too shy to do that. But yeah, so I think all of that was probably swirling around in my head. Um, and, it, and, and it is also that feeling. I don't know if you had when you moved to New York, um, of like endless possibility and like anything could happen. And I do remember like walking randomly running across. I don't know if you ever experienced this. It was like Chenguin. It was this like performance art. It was like people had were dressed in these enormous like mascot looking costumes that were like half penguin, half chicken. And there was another one that was like half penguin, half skunk. And I remember the first time I ever heard about it, one of my classmates had like gone downtown because we also were like in Lincoln Center on the Upper West Side and in class all the time. So we didn't really have a lot of time to actually go around anywhere. We were pretty, you know, and I I, I was like a little scared, too. So I was just basically on the Upper West Side for like a year or two. (laughs) But I remember like one of my classmates like went downtown and came back with this enormous plastic egg. And we're like, what is this? And she's like, I was like in where was she? And like asked her place. And there were all these these like plastic eggs and this thing. And then I remember walking through Soho with my friend and suddenly we were like swept up into this performance thing. And these people are dressed in these costumes and they're playing like a game of football and it was totally spontaneous. And the police came and shut it down and like, but a whole crowd had formed. And so, you know, when things like that are happening around you, it kind of makes you feel like you could do something like that too. I don't know. I was, yeah. Yeah. I was, I had my similar thing was was basically um, I had an iPod uh-huh. at the time and I went to very specific locations that I had heard in songs. Oh. So I was like going around the West Village and listening to Bob Dylan and being like, he was here, man, <gasps> you know, and <laughs> so sweet. it's so stupid. That's I've never so told these stories. Sweet. You know, and then I was just like, yeah, I was like, I wonder, I wonder what life was, was yeah. like right here. You know, what what was Dylan thinking? You know, and then I would go to um, to where, you know, because I, I was into music, but music that I thought was like cooler than what my friends were into. Yeah. Like, I'll admit, I because I just didn't really know. So I was, you know, it was basically just like Paul Simon and, and Bob Dylan and, and, you know, like old singer songwriter stuff, which are still good. And, you know, I remember going to where Paul Simon's house was and I was like, I wonder how many times he came out here. Like what was going through his head? Like, like I could catch some sort of hidden energy of (laughs) musicianship. Um, But yeah, I did little walking tours like that, not like official ones, but I would just kind of make my own and walk around neighborhoods trying to pretend that I was, you know, Dylan. That's really sweet. (laughs) I love that you did. Well, it didn't it didn't work. Yeah, um, but it's like, because obviously, you know, (laughs) I don't know. I also didn't grow up in a city that was like a walking city in that way. So I just would like yeah. sometimes just wander around for hours at a time because um, I had nothing. Like, did you ever go to the Dakota, like thinking that like you're going to catch John Lennon's ghost or something? <laughs> no, but that was not far from where I went to school. So I would. Yeah. If I was going to the park yeah. and wanting to go in that entrance, I would walk by the Dakota. Yeah. I don't even think I fully knew that. I was just like, what is that building? That's incredible. I mean, it's still one of the most beautiful yeah, buildings. I would love, yeah. I've never been inside. I would love 
to be able to like see an apartment in the Dakota. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't think many people have, I mean, it's still also super, super private. Mm -hmm. Like no matter how wealthy you are, you can't even, I think they have like a specific board and you have to buy, you have, I mean, even if you have like unlimited money, you can't just like get it. Um, But I remember going by Strawberry Fields, which is next door to the Dakota. And one of the times there was like a bunch of I don't know, maybe Columbia kids or college kids or whatever, or Juilliard kids. It, and they're all sitting there. I was going to like, oh God, it was probably Juilliard kids. Well, <laughs> and they were all singing John Lennon songs. It and, it, and I didn't realize kids. I was there on his birthday. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to join in too. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that was also at this time where, you know, like we were talking about where there's this like innocence where um, I didn't realize that the clothes I was wearing w- would really, it, it affected how people saw me, but thus really affected how I saw myself. Yeah. And I think there was that special time that I still try to figure out now as an adult where, you know, I'm, you know, what wouldn't whatever I put on, I'm trying to be conscious of like, what is, you know, how how is this gonna make myself feel? You know, yeah. like even when I'm going to drop off my kid at school in my head, you know, I have a few friends who live in LA and they're like, man, I gotta get dressed for the carpool line. You know? Oh really? Like I Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're like, you know, because you you want to have some sort of um pride and you know and and how you look you know and uh i don't think any of my friends are at a level where the fact that they don't have pride (laughs) is the pride of it you know but like having having some sort of fit you know that they get off uh yeah i think that there's there's definitely something there but like you you carry this with you obviously as you you left new york i mean you you have a very (laughs) unique and cool personal style i mean we got to talk about the big hats if you don't mind Yes, I do have a very unique personal style, which, yeah, these days involves an enormous hat. And um, I I was thinking about, yes, I think probably it goes back to my love of um, like 30s, 40s. There were a lot of great hats in movies back in the day. I actually have a hat box full of vintage yeah. hats in the yeah. other room. <laughs> oh my god you got all the gear you gotta have like an archive um, or something. some that were like my grandmother some i bought at vintage stores and so i think i always liked that i was really into like rosalind russell and she always i felt like wore like amazing hats in movies and then i also um mm-hmm. was in the south of france for five months last year working on um on something and there's so many in- incredible straw hats that are like traditional to Provence in that area and I think I got yeah. like inspired seeing those and so yeah I have an enormous straw hat that I really like that is probably pretty distinctive <laughs> I, I would say it's extremely distinctive it's you, you know I mean do you do you have like do you uh like build your fits for when you're going outside <laughs> or is it just like whatever's by the door I, you know some there's more or less thought put into it depending on the day <laughs> more or less yeah. thought yeah sometimes it's yeah sometimes i really feel like i'm putting together an outfit and sometimes i i'm not really thinking about it at at all really but a lot of clogs too which i think does tie back to my grandmother she wore as i said earlier she wore clogs all the time by the time i was a kid clogs as in birkenstocks or you're like no like i'm i'm um you know i'm on some neo brands that no one's if, heard of clogs. if by neo brands no one's heard of you mean Dansko clogs yes <laughs> oh okay those are like yeah those are like food yes. service and health and, service yeah. yeah so i that's that's pretty much my day-to-day issue at this point taking care of the arches i get it got to. yeah you got to try hofflingers i don't okay, know if you send ever me, tried those send it to me yeah they're house shoes okay they're german wool felt house shoes i'll Ooh, send them okay. to you and you know they're specifically made for wearing in your home um okay. so like are you are you a shoes off house like if someone comes over you take your shoes off i either way i'm i'm i whatever you want to do I'm well i'll say this i'm a shoes off house i don't care who you are if you walk into the house take your damn shoes off <laughs> but we um but we have like house shoes that we'll yeah. wear around the house you know and a lot of this was from new york because you know i i lived in new york for 16 17 years and your you know your feet would be pretty like, I don't know, God knows where you're stepping in. Right. And so we had to, you know, we had specific house shoes and it's something that's kind of like, you know, my wife and I have like, we've carried it in, uh, to our, our place in the suburbs now. And these Hofflingers swear to God, no free ads, but like, man, they're, they're the greatest little warm, cozy shoes. And they got some nice arch support and stuff. Cause everyone's right. like, Oh, I'm wearing Birkenstocks or I'm wearing, and I'm like, nah, fam, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the new, new. All right. Send them my way. I'm open. 
<laughs> yeah. Um, I also want to talk about Tom Brown because I know you're yes. you're quite the fan of of Tom Brown. Absolutely. Um, and they're quite the fans of you, by the way. Me? Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> the t- no, I'm serious. Like, yeah, they are big fans of you. One of my one of my good friends is like employee number six at Tom Brown. Wow. And uh, for a long time, you were on their uh, mood board. I, I told I told Chris this. Oh, he did not pass this along. I did not know that. Oh, that's hugely flattering. I I love Tom Brown. Yes, I I um if I was to adopt like a day in day out single outfit at this point, it would might be Tom Brown. Interesting. Um, yeah. I'm I'm really into the shirts. I'm trying to think of like what else I have been wearing lately. Well, I think your stuff's so unique. I mean, the fact that like many of the things that you referenced were things that are more or less one of one is yeah. is pretty phenomenal. I mean, that's what most folks strive towards. Like, have you have you ever had anything personally made for you as an adult? I don't think I've ever had anything made for me, but I have like benefited from and really understand the power of tailoring. Um mm from costume designers and stylists that I've worked with. Yeah. Um, that That's amazing. Um, so definitely that. Um, and I don't always get things, I don't often get things tailored, but I've seen the huge difference that that can make. But I'm trying to think of anything made for me, not off the top of my head, but I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking at another one of my grandmother's coats that I totally wear still. I have got a couple of her coats that I still wear. You have uh, to send me pictures of this. I will. If you're okay with sharing. This is incredible. Will. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of what else I have around oh my here. God. Yeah, I have I have so many things. I really need to like work on purging it, but then I get really sentimental about it, which is why I think everyone just started in the family started sending everything to me. Oh, um, okay. That makes sense. So yes. the stuff that you were mentioning earlier, it's not like you carry these I was not, I moved lived. so many times in New York. That would have been insanity. You know, I, I, <laughs> well, I, was, I know that's what I was saying. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> I had, I had, I owned almost nothing when I lived in New York. Um, it, this is like, since I've moved to LA that my mom okay. just slowly started sending things to me, but some of the coats I had had for a long time and was wearing, um, even before then. Um, but yeah, it, I think, uh, I've become the repository. I mean, like, oh my God, <laughs> I have these like enormous so my grandmother my grandmother loved to be in the newspaper the local newspaper and so i have organized i have all these she's holding up a binder of news clippings yeah i have Goodness gracious. so many of them um and so my what mom's an honor to your grandma yeah to be honest with you that's that's really i mean i think that says more about the fact of how much you care <laughs> about the relationships of people who've poured into you than it oh. does just your ability to save there's something well, there it, you know, it's really cool because I also I was going through all these boxes of things that my um, aunt sent me. And, you know, my grandmother ha- was a person of a lot of unfulfilled dreams and desires and ambition. And so, oh, okay. you know, artist, clothing designer, she really wanted to go to college. There were a lot of things that she didn't get to do, I think, in the way that she wanted to do them or at all. And so I found um, some like wallpaper pattern designs that she had done and I had those framed and hung them up and I kind of have a a desire to like get you know it printed as wallpaper I have some like sketches she did that I framed and hung um and so it's really cool like I have all uh, oh talking about like inspirations as a kid I have all these um scrapbooks that she made when she was young where she was cutting out pictures from magazines of actresses and models and so I have those and I used to do my own version of that. Like I said, I had my Vanity Fair subscription, you know, and I was like cutting out pictures from like ad campaigns that I really liked. And you do you know. still scrapbook? My mm-hmm. wife does this literally every night. Oh, She's, really? I'm downstairs playing. I'm downstairs like trying to watch some Criterion thing. Yeah. And or playing video games. I'll just be <laughs> honest. And she is upstairs. <laughs> And she's got like some sort of screen on that's on like as a passive thing where she's usually either listening to a true crime podcast or watching some sort of, you know, thing. And then she's scrapbooking in which she'll take magazine cutouts and she'll put them like superimpose them over her journal or over. Yeah. I mean, but there's she she just loves the like, I don't know, like scrapbook and save that stuff. Yeah, I have not done it recently, but I totally understand the appeal of it and you know, I think that me as a as a kid with these dreams and ambitions of becoming an actor and I was looking at, you know, I, I, my like my huge goal in life was to be in a play uh, that 
uh, was reviewed in the New Yorker and Richard Avedon took my portrait. Do you remember that when he used to take portraits of, yes. uh, uh, that was like my dream, which never happened, but that I just remember like every issue of the New Yorker where there'd be a Richard Avedon photo of someone in a play in New yeah. York, just being like, Oh, this would be incredible. Um, did so, your, yeah. did your grandma get to see you achieve the no, success? no, she, um, she had Alzheimer's and she died. Um, okay. Sorry. No, thank you. I, I don't even know if she ever saw me in a play like as a kid, but no, certainly not for it. But my grandpa, who I was very close to, he did. He got to see me in movies and TV shows and plays. And so, oh, that's yeah. so cool. That's so cool. Yeah. <laughs> Is it, do you think that's where like so much of your like the gratitude came from? Because like the thing that runs throughout this is there's like this joy and I'm not trying to project on you. So push back <laughs> if you need to. But like sure. there's like this joy and in, in gratitude for everything I mean, you've accomplished. I'm very lucky, you know. Uh, um, well, OK, no, I, I mean, I'll give you that some you in know, some ways, but you worked at it. Yeah. But I mean, there's also, you know, I, I've gotten to make a career out of what I wanted to do as a child. And that's pretty amazing. Um, yeah. and my, yeah, my grandfather, I was so close to my grandfather. He was really like a father to me. Um, and I'm lucky that he made it to 95. So, you know, oh, wow. I, I got to, you know, have, have that relationship with him also as an adult. Um, and I would just call him all the time. And I just always remember like walking around Manhattan and every time I called him, he'd be like, what's that noise? What's that noise? What's that? I'm like, it's Manhattan. It's, it's a truck. It's a, you know, it's like, it's continuous. Are you okay? Noise. What's going on? Yeah, it's just like continuously like, what's that noise? What's that noise? <laughs> uh, and so, you know, he was, he was just, he was the best um, and really fun and love to have a good time and a little bit like naughty. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You mean just like staying out late sort of thing? Oh, he loved. Yeah. So my family owned a brewery. So he, <laughs> he definitely. Okay. Yeah. So he was the last person in the family to run the brewery. Um, and, but like, you know, he would like be the grandpa that had like chocolates up his sleeve or like in his pocket, you know, and we weren't supposed to have chocolates or, you know, he, yeah. Um, he liked to have a good time. Um, and everybody loved him. He was a very, and it going, so the, the brewery, which had been around for like a hundred years. Um, and when I would go around Erie with him, which is where my mom grew up, people yeah. still knew him because he had been, you know, his father ran the brewery. He had run the brewery. And almost everywhere I'd go with him, people would be coming up to him being like, I used to drive the truck you know, that was my job after high school or my dad worked for, you know, there's just so many he, people who knew him and loved him in Erie. Um, so he was, yeah, he was oh, the best. That's so cool. <laughs> um, you know, but before we wrap though, I did want to ask you if you, as someone who's loves the golden age of Hollywood, what are some of the movies that you turn on when you're sick? Well, you know, I, I, um, like I said, I was a big Catherine Hepburn fan, a yep. big, um, Cary Grant fan. Um, Ooh. he was my first crush. He was like, I was obsessed with Cary Grant as a child. Um, so I, I really loved their movies together. I love his movies separately from her. Like I said, Rosalind Russell. So I loved his girl Friday, that kind of like banter, the back and forth, the wit, the repartee that they had. So loved- good. Have you watched the criterion, his girl Friday? Like the the, re- the restoration of it, it's really good. I I have to check it out. I also yeah. loved um, bringing up baby, um, Philadelphia story. When you're talking about like movies from the library, we had like a few. We only owned a few movies, um, mm-hmm. and one of them was To Catch a Thief. And so the costumes in To Catch a Thief, I mean, are just extraordinary. Um, so I watched that movie a lot as a child. I haven't really watched it that much as an adult, but there's some lines. It holds up. There's, yeah, there are lines from that are just like seared in my brain, like John Roby, the cat burglar, you know, <laughs> like, um, and I think, yeah, I think that was Edith Head who designed that. Um, yeah. I was actually got into watching, uh, Columbo. Um, and you know, she's in an, Edith Head is in an episode of Columbo. As herself. Really? Yes. I'll have to check this out. You got to check it out because like this, they come into her office on the show and she has all of her Oscars 
there in the office. It's it's pretty incredible. Um, I'm trying to think of whatever other movies I watch. Um, golly gee. Uh, Funny oh, like Face we, is something that I, yes, I would always we go back to. we were talking about Audrey Hepburn. Yeah. And, yeah, I was I was also, I, I remember that book I was telling you about that talked about all the personal style of all the um the actresses, the the chapter on Audrey Hepburn was talking about how she had developed this uniform for herself, which was all black, a black shirt, like black cigarette pants and black shoes. And I can't mm-hmm. remember which movie it was, but there was some director who made her add white socks to it. And she was so upset that she went in her trailer and cried because it was <laughs> ruining the effect of the outfit and she had to eventually come around to it. I have to <laughs> look up which story, but that was also like, burned in my memory as a child of like she had developed this look and it was very intentional and it created this effect that she wanted and this director was making her add white socks and she was so profoundly upset by it (laughs) yeah it's that stuff is so amazing to me especially like as i've dug in to you know i always loved cary grant when i was younger and i didn't really realize how much that guy cared about tailoring Mm -hmm. until i started to you know like i mean i went nuts reading anything and everything I could. I have this lost GQ interview that's out of print that I found at a library and then went and scanned. I can send it to you, but he talks specifically about his clothes. Yeah. And I remember I was like kind of shocked because in my head, right, I was like, oh, I bet everything is so, you know, planned and he thinks about this and, and, you know, and his style is so perfect that, you know, there has to be a master plan behind it. And he basically talks like, no, you would just go to Brooks Brothers. And I didn't realize I'm like, oh, like clothing wasn't like ready to wear was still very new Mm -hmm. for that sort of time. And and he was like freaking out over the fact that he could go into Brooks Brothers, grab a jacket and leave versus getting something made. And it totally like, you know, changed my whole perspective because I, I also loved Steve McQueen yeah. and, you know, and every other stereotypical sort of cool guy of that era. And, you know, the more I learned about them, the more I found out that their style was just really their their behavior uh-huh. versus the the choice of clothing that they made. That really reminds me of another thing. I just remember, you know, having read all these Katherine Hepburn biographies as a child. There was like one point when she was going on auditions and she was wearing a sweater that had a hole in it. And Mm -hmm. her agents were like saying, you can't wear this to these auditions and these the executives and the casting people, they don't understand it. And she said something like, if they don't have enough imagination to cover this hole, then they're like not worth working with or something like that. You know, and she, oh, wow. she was so singular in her personal style, you know, yeah. um, that I think that also had a big impact on me as a kid. Um, how she dressed in her day to day life, you know, was really, um, I think ahead of, I mean, like I would wear those outfits right now. <laughs> you know, like yeah, I mean, it's all very, very timeless. Yes, um, yeah. So yeah, so she, she, her, just sort of like attitude and her approach to style and life and how she sort of carried herself. Um, that I, I know that that was hugely impactful for me too, even if it Are might there... not be evident <laughs> if you're looking at me right now. <laughs> no, I mean, well, first off, we're you know this is we're recording, so it's don't worry <laughs> about any of this stuff. But I mean, all other photos and stuff of you. I mean, I think that was also one of the reasons why I really wanted to chat is because you you have a very a very unique sense of style, and I think like how you carry yourself versus you know there are other people, and this isn't like not shots or anything into which it's like oh you just wear what you get for free, right? Uh-huh. And like having a point of view, <laughs> I think is very underrated these days yeah. for some reason because many people they're just cool, I got it for free, or I'm so insecure, I don't ever want to put my own, you know, style out there at the risk of someone judging it, you know, and I yeah. think there's there's two strong oh perspectives there. Well, I remember uh, living in Williamsburg and trying to put together what I thought was like a cool outfit. And okay. um, I remember my worst nightmare coming true, which was I was walking down Bedford And I saw these two girls and they were, you know, obviously had a lot of money and like really expensive purse and all these things. And and I heard them be like, and I realized they were ripping my entire outfit apart from head to toe, just like everything I had on there. And I knew that I wasn't imagining it because I had this Mark Jacobs tote bag. I had shot this movie in Boston. And I think maybe at one point he was doing like city specific like totes. And I had gone to the Mark Jacobs store in Boston. And so it was like it said Boston on it. And I just remember yeah. and the capper was like, is that a Boston bag that uh, 
seared into my brain. So yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely, um, you know, a fear of mine is that everyone <laughs> is making fun of what I am wearing. And I experienced that in junior high and high school when I was wearing my grandmother's funky jewelry and, you know, patchwork skirts to school and her shoes when I was in seventh grade. But I guess um, not enough that I, uh, you know, don't stop putting together a kind of um, uh, specific outfits. I think I think you did OK. OK, yeah. thank you. So I, I um, I'll tell you this story. So we're starting, you know, I was saying earlier, my daughter started kindergarten and we went to one of these like meet the teacher nights. Right. And so it was like kids were there with their parents. Yeah. And one of the reasons why I moved to New York when I was younger was because I, you know, didn't really have the best high school experience mm -hmm. here. Um, I loved clothes. People called me the F word, all sorts of stuff. And um, I saw this woman there and I was like, I think I was like, I went to high school with her. Wow. And she was like a really popular, you know, woman or girl at the time in high school. And um, I saw her and I was like, hey, you know, I was like, it's it's Jeremy and, and you know, how you doing? And I was so terrified again of like what she thought of me mm -hmm. and like what I was wearing and like in my head like that stuff never bothers me anymore but it was like there was this tiny moment where it's like I went back in time to high school and I was terrified of like what you know yeah. what was she going to think of me and uh and even though like I feel very confident now and like you know I'm married happily and I have kids and life is peachy right but it was like that tiny moment there that I saw her and I was like oh no like what is she gonna say is yeah. she gonna make you know and it's funny because she's like what do you do now I was like oh I do this podcast about clothes and fashion she was like oh that's cool she's like yeah I remember you were always really into clothes and stuff and I was like yep yep <laughs> and I'm like slowly like fading into the bushes like Homer Simpson you know it was just like but it was that that weird moment where you know I think there's still a part of many people's lives where you know, when you're experimenting and you're figuring things out and you're like very vulnerable based on someone where, you know, I, I who cares about yeah. those ding dongs that you pass by? I mean, jokes on them. You're you're doing pretty good. Life's <laughs> life's peachy, you know, so I think that's uh, that's something that I always try to think about now whenever I'm going to put something on that, like maybe it's I don't know, maybe someone's going to comment on it on Instagram or some, yeah. you know, rando is going to say I should hit the gym more or something. I don't know. But I still go back to the well. <laughs> I mean, I still love it. Yeah. I still love it. <laughs> well, there is so much to love, too. And like, that's also really, you know, I was talking about like going back to the excitement and everything of like that feeling when you discover a new designer that you were really into. And mm -hmm. it's a whole other way of being in the world. And, um, and so I, you know, I still feel that way when you discover someone new that you're really into and um is there anyone new you discover that you've been as i was in saying or, that i was like new to you Gill i was like gillian come up with an answer as i was saying that i was like you know it's all right we got, got nothing there no this is like <laughs> this is not new at all this is not new i'm not saying this is new but like you know uh it definitely dries van noten is a designer that i love and that i that's like. serious taste right there that's if you know you know <laughs> So that's definitely a designer where um, I, you know, try and buy some of their stuff. I, I don't own a ton, but I, I love Dries Van Noten. That's, um, uh, wh where did you get turned on to Dries? I mean, that's. R.I.P. opening ceremony. <sighs> right? Yeah. A store so ahead of its time. Yeah. I mean, that was, that was huge for me when that opened in New York, too. I remember going yeah. there and just being like, what? Um. So yeah, definitely discovered so many designers from opening ceremony. Yeah. And Do you, are there any stores in LA that you hit up or just to kind of browse um, for inspiration? I mean, back in the back back in the day, I someone mm -hmm. introduced me to Maxfield, which like I didn't even know clothes could cost that much money, you know. And, I, <laughs> and once again, like I told you of me going around Barney's or Bergdorf, Maxfield yeah. was the LA version of that for me where I would just like walk around and um was like too scared to like try anything on but i was like just blown away by maxfield um in more recent time i guess dover street market you know we've lost so many stores um so dover street market uh was definitely um a store that i will go to and browse around and um do you still have that yeah, feeling when you go to stores yeah Get like, out of, come I, on really I mean, it's so cool. It's like different versions of yourself that you could see. You know, when I was, I told you, oh. I was like um, 
shooting that uh, I was I was working in like the south of I was in Marseille and there was like yeah. a really someone in the cast told me about this great clothing store slash like cafe that was really near to where I was living and mm-hmm. so I started going in there all the time and um looking at their clothes and like French clothing lines that I'd never heard of before or, or other ones that I did know and um and yeah I got that like same nervous um, oh going into a cool store with like cool people that work there who are dressed really cool feeling. Yeah, I get um, like nervous walking into like Dover Street Market, <laughs> you know, like there is some I, wild I stuff in there. Yeah, it's like, well, what is this neon green paint on the wall? <laughs> that means, oh, it's clothes and you rip it off and wrap it around you. And you're like, oh, OK, didn't know that. <laughs> yeah, but I think I, I still have that like intimidation factor. But I I also get really inspired by it. And then um I really like going to like vintage stores and antique stores too. And some that have like a wide mixture of some clothing, some home goods, stuff like that. So I really enjoy doing that as well. And I haven't gone to too many estate sales, but I would definitely be open to going to more estate sales too. And I think that's really cool too, just to, um, I love, you know, uh, like object, object, whatever you call it. Like I like, you know, things, uh, (laughs) from earlier eras and um i can get really into that as well but as i told you i'm very sentimental so i have to be like very careful about like uh not buying too many like little things that serve no purpose um uh, yeah. i don't want to fall into the clutter uh you know space so i have to be kind of rigorous with myself but yeah, yeah. i if, if you like estate sales yeah come to the midwest because it's like this stuff that people have and it's not like a cultural thing or like oh they don't get it but like there's just so much yeah you know and i mean you you grew up in the midwest there's a lot of stuff around there well that's a subject um, of great debate is what is pittsburgh it's because if you say you're the midwest (laughs) other people from the midwest will tell you that you're not and you're not east coast so you're kind of it's true you're you're right you're not really you're you're your own thing you got a real (laughs) jets and sharks mentality over there yeah Yeah. it's like (laughs) philadelphia will tell you that you're not the east coast and you know ohio and indiana will tell you you're not midwest so like what are you you're 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 western pennsylvania pittsburgh's mid yeah (laughs) but there's the, the estate sales around here where i mean there's people that have lived you know And some, like even the house that we bought, it was from the people who built it. Wow. And, you know, I mean, there wasn't any stuff here when we got it, but like, I remember looking at estate sales and there was a bunch of like old, I mean, they had to be cleaned, which took hours, but a bunch of old Bertoya chairs and these beautiful chairs. And I think they wanted 25 bucks for each chair. And, you know, they're from the seventies and they had the covers, like the actual leather covers (sighs) with the the foam in there. Now the foam was like kind of falling apart a little bit because of time and set in a garage. But I was like, these are incredible. And there's, but like, I see all that stuff. I'm like, oh, I got to get it. And then I bring it home and I'm like, this doesn't fit with anything (laughs) here. And so you just put it there and it's like, everything is so eclectic where it's like, well, but this is special and unique. And you're like, yeah, but it doesn't fit with anything else that you own. I think I've also crossed the precipice of too many chairs too. Like more more chairs than (laughs) <laughs> than I could possibly need. Yeah, there's yeah. a chair quote out there. there I, I agree. <laughs> well, Gillian, thank you so, so much for coming on the show. Oh, my um, pleasure. You've been extremely, extremely generous with your time. But before we wrap, though, is there anything you want to add, mention that I didn't discuss with you or whatever? Oh, I did um, a guest episode of this podcast, um, 99% Invisible, that I'm very proud of, about the history of the Hollywood Walk of Fame. So... Oh, I'll plug uh, that. That was really fun. I got to Was it with of, Roman Mars group yes, or was yes. it? Yes, so I okay. I like guest produced, guest reported an episode for them. Um so it is uh it's about the Hollywood Walk of Fame and so I I did a kind of a mini history of Hollywood the city and Hollywood the industry and how they intersect and what the relationship between the two is like and how that led to the creation of the Walk of Fame and what purpose it served and how it's changed over the decades. So that was really cool. And going back to my interest in, you know, old Hollywood, I sort of, I I bookended it with um, the director, Dorothy Arzner, who was sort of the reason that I um, got inspired to do that episode. And um, so she did direct Catherine Hepburn, my 
my childhood hero in one movie. Holy moly. Um, and so she was the first one. She was the first woman to uh, join the DGA, the Directors Guild. She still holds the record for most studio films directed by a woman. I think that's the correct verbiage. Uh, it's sadly oh, wow. never been beat. She is not yet to be beat in terms of like Hollywood studio films directed by a woman. Um, and she was kind of forced into early retirement at a pretty young age. Um, and after retirement, wound up teaching at UCLA. And her most famous student was Francis Ford Coppola. So I got him to answer a few questions for the podcast about Whoa. about Miss Arzner um, and his recollections of her as a teacher and a director and everything. So I'm really proud of that. Um, 99%. Holy invisible. moly. Yeah, I'll definitely plug that. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, it was it was great to meet you. And I appreciate you coming on. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much for listening. You've been listening to Blamo. Our show is produced by Blamo Media. We're edited by Amar Lal and our theme music by the mysterious Breakmaster Cylinder. If you like what you heard, share the pod with a friend, leave a review on Apple Podcasts, give us five stars or whatever it is on Spotify. And you can follow us on Instagram for all the hot content at Blamo Podcast. If you want to talk to us, you can send us an email at info at blamopod.com. Last but not least, if you want to hang out and join the Blam Fam, Visit patreon.com forward slash blammo, where we have tons of exclusive episodes and our amazing Slack community. All right, folks, thanks so much. We'll see you soon.